Series webinar for 2011. My name is Peter Niger and I'm the Internal Operations Manager for Students for Liberty. Now today we're honored to have Lawrence Reed with us tonight to discuss the great myths of the Great Depression. But before we begin though, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Students for Liberty if you're unfamiliar with us. Students for Liberty is a 501c3 nonprofit organization that is run for students and by students who are dedicated to liberty. We were formed around three years ago to serve a previously unfilled niche in our universities by connecting liberty-friendly students with other students, faculty, organization, and resources to help them advance their ideas on campus. Now, we offer a variety of resources and hold conferences across the country, and uh, we're very excited in about three weeks to host our fourth annual International Students for Liberty Conference on February 18th through 20th at George Washington University. This conference will feature a live taping of the John Stossel Show and a large variety of sessions from the top liberty organizations in the world on the ideas of liberty, public policy, career mentoring, activism, and leadership training. I would encourage you to sign up quickly for this if you haven't already. We're running out of room. We have approximately 375 students signed up right now from about 20 different countries. It's going to be a great time. It's going to be a great weekend. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today. Lauren Reed is currently the president of the Foundation for Economic Education. He holds a bachelor's degree in economics from Grove City College and a master's degree in history from Slippery Rock State University, both of which are in Pennsylvania. Now, we're going to have about a 45-minute um, presentation from Lawrence, and then we're going to move into about 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions, feel free to type in in the question box, and myself and Clark Rupert here will field those questions to Lawrence. Now, without any further ado, I present Lawrence Reed. Okay, good evening. I assume that uh, I'm coming through loud and clear? Yep, yep. coming through loud, loud and clear. clear. Okay, thank you very much, uh, uh, Peter and Alexander and Clark and everyone at Students for Liberty. I appreciate this opportunity very much, and I especially want to thank all of you who have tuned in tonight. I think it's terrific that you've taken uh, an hour out of your time to hear me talk about the Great Depression. Uh, so I salute you. In fact, I toast you with my mug. Not this one, but this one. And if you can read it, it says, uh, Resist Socialism. So with that, uh, let's talk about the Great Depression. Uh, clearly, by any measure, the Great Depression of the 1930s was a national trauma. But we had at one point unemployment that approached 30 uh, percent, certainly uh, well into the high 20s. Uh, uh, about half of industrial production was idle at the worst of the Depression. And uh, there was a great deal of despair and hopelessness across the country, and even very some uh, rumors of uh, impending revolt in certain places. So it was a dire time uh, economically and some would say even uh, politically, certainly I would, uh, because of the threats to our basic forms of government that uh, the policies of the 1930s uh, posed. Uh, but this was not the first depression in American history. We had a number of them before, uh, 1819, we had one in 1836, 37. We had another in 1853, 1873. Uh, a big one in 1893 that lasted uh, about three and a half years. And uh, then it was a big one in 1921 as well, but it lasted uh, ever so briefly and was over uh, in a matter of months. What makes the Great Depression great primarily is its uh, duration and its depth. In terms of duration, it lasted at least uh, from 1929 to 1941. That's a 12-year depression. Uh, that's the time frame that most people would assign to the Great Depression, but I would actually go a bit further and argue that the Great Depression went from 1929 until about 1945, uh, a 16-year depression. And I'll get to that a little later, but uh, I don't believe you really saw signs of a sustainable or, uh, or uh, broad-based recovery, I should say, until after World War II. So this is a pretty long depression. This is three or four times longer than any previous depression in American history. Now, that, that cries out for explanation. What, why would this one last so long? Uh, and also, the depth of it was greater than any that came before. Unemployment in the depression of the 1890s uh, may have 
approached uh, 20 percent, but uh, nothing like 28, 29 percent of the Great Depression. So I hope tonight to explain why the Depression happened in the first place and then what uh, prolonged it and kept us in Depression three to four times longer than any uh, previous uh, such episode in American history. Now, I, I think the best way to understand the Depression is not to think of it as one giant 12-year or 16-year slump, uh, but rather to think of it as uh, sort of like four depressions rolled into one, or if you will, four phases of one big depression. That's the way I'll present it tonight, four phases. Uh, each of these phases uh, has a name to it, uh, and uh, I'll start with the very first one, and this is the monetary or the financial phase of the Great Depression. Now, this phase explains why it happened in the first place. What brought it about? What made 1929 occur? The subsequent phases will explain what kept us in depression and for a time uh, allowed it even to get worse before it got better. Uh, if we had a whole hour just to talk about uh, trade cycle theory, uh, we could easily consume that. You could, you could spend an entire semester on it, in fact. But I'm going to condense what I believe to be uh, the soundest of uh, a variety of trade cycle theories, the Austrian trade cycle theory, and tell you that these cycles don't come um, out of nowhere. They aren't uh, indigenous or endogenous, I sh uh, I sh or I should say, uh, not internal to the free market itself. They are the results of intervention. They, these cycles of boom and bust come about because of mischief with the monetary system. I think with time, more and more economists are coming to realize that what happens to money and credit uh, has an awful lot to, to say about the state of the economy. Uh, and uh, many of us, those of us who are Austrian certainly, believe that manipulation of money and credit uh, is at the, the root of these uh, boom-bust cycles. We argue that when government, monetary authorities, uh, in our case the Federal Reserve, which has been the case since 1913, when government decides for whatever reason or reasons to inflate the money and credit supply, it could be because they want to finance a war, they want to take care of their deficit spending, there's always another program to fund, a, a, uh, a monument to build, a great society scheme of uh, spending programs to uh, throw money at. For whatever reason, when government decides to expand the supply of money and credit, the initial effect is to reduce interest rates. That's basically a supply and demand explanation. Interest rates reflect the supply and demand of lendable funds. And when the banks are flush with these funds, whether they result uh, from people saving more or from the monetary authorities injecting reserves into the banking system, the result in the short run is the same. Interest rates decline. Uh, and People rush to borrow the newly created money, not individuals so much as, uh, as businesses, and they invest in capital spending. That's why you see over the course of these cycles a greater uh, uh, expansion of capital goods industries in the boom phase than you see in consumer goods, and you see a greater bust in the uh, down phase in capital goods than you see in consumer goods. That's where much of the newly created money and credit goes. So you see lower interest rates at first, but at some point either the monetary authorities uh, pull back, perhaps even contract, but at least they uh, don't expand the money and credit supply as much as they did before, so the effect of the first injection begins to wear off, things begin to slump, interest rates take, uh, begin to take off, uh, and then you have the down phase. Well, that hardly does justice to Austrian trade cycle theory, but uh, that's at the root of our discussion tonight in explaining the first phase of the Great Depression. The question now arises, well, did we have an inflation of money and credit in the uh, uh, period leani leading up to the collapse in 1929? And we certainly did. We saw all the outward signs of it. Uh, uh, this was the time that we call the Roaring Twenties, uh, the, the mid to late Twenties. Uh, there was a land boom in Florida. Much of the newly created money found its way onto the stock market, uh, bidding prices up to uh, record highs. Interest rates were uh, dramatically depressed early on, uh, but that will change late in the decade. 
uh, the boom that is fostered by this climate of easy money uh, will give way to contraction of the money supply in the bust that begins to take place in 1929. Now, if you want more information about uh, the extent of the money creation uh, by the Federal Reserve from 1924 to 1929, well then uh, take a look at uh, Murray Rothbard's classic book, America's Great Depression. He argues that uh, some important measures of the money supply during that roughly five-year period leading up to the crash of 29 rose by something like uh, 65, 66 percent. Others may differ with that percentage or the particular measurement of the money supply that uh, Professor Rothbard used, but few people will quarrel with the notion that uh, we had easy money, that we had a roaring economy uh, thanks to uh, artificially depressed interest rates that were not sustainable, fostered by the Federal Reserve from about 1924 uh, to uh, 1929. Now, uh, when you look behind the headlines and look at the things that uh, few people really would know to look for, such as money supply, you find that in late 1928, the Federal Reserve quietly began to shift its policy away from this very substantial expansion of money and credit uh, to what would become first a decline in the, in the growth rate of money followed by an actual contraction. Now, did the Fed intend, after inflating by some 65 percent, uh, did it actually intend for the money supply to fall as it did by some one-third between 1929 and 1933? Uh, my estimation is that, that it got out of hand, that they uh, did not intend for it to collapse by that much. But this, again, is a testimony to the failure of central planning, and this time the monetary sphere. Uh, they really didn't know what they were doing to some degree. And uh, I, I think, try as they might, uh, after the contraction began, they got a little out of hand and uh, perhaps surprised even the Fed. Uh, but if you sense that I'm a skeptic of central banking and central planning of money and credit, you're absolutely right. This is one of the salient lessons of the Great Depression. Do not trust a handful of political appointees uh, to decide what the proper supply of money and credit for a nation should be. I mean, it's Even Ben Bernanke, the current head of the Federal Reserve, has admitted publicly uh, to Milton Friedman, no less, that the Fed brought on the Great Depression through its mismanagement uh, of the money supply. Uh, well, the, the money supply will begin to contract, and uh, the stock market sensed this. Um, uh, some very important market participants sensed it first. Some of the big money folks like the Joseph P. Kennedys and the Bernard Baruchs, uh, who by early to mid-1929 realized that, hey, the party's over. This can't go on, these soaring stock prices, because the Federal Reserve has changed its policy. Money supply, credit supply is contracting interest rates are soaring, so they began to sell their stocks. The stock market will actually peak out in August of um, 1929, even though most Americans, to the extent they know anything about the period, uh, remember the great crash of Black Thursday, October 24, 1929. We should say something about that. It would be mistaken for people to assume that that's what caused the depression. The stock market collapsed and then dragged everything else and everybody else down with it. I've heard that argument before, but it's, it really doesn't hold water. It was reflecting, the stock market was reflecting what uh, was happening behind the scenes with money and credit. And as I say, it had peaked out in August under the pressure of the selling of those who did know before others did that money supply was uh, reversing course. It wasn't until the masses of people saw the handwriting on the wall and a, a sense of fear spread rather quickly uh, that you had uh, a stampede. That was October 24, 1929. There were a lot of di bad days after that Black Thursday, uh, but uh, in, in no event caused the Depression. It was reflective of the underlying monetary policy. Now, uh, if nothing else had happened, Perhaps 1930 could have gone down as a year of recovery after a short uh, downturn. And maybe this would have gone down in history as something similar to what had happened a few years before in 1921, uh, when we had a very sharp crash in the stock market and a spike in unemployment. But that mini-depression was over within a matter of months because the government didn't intervene. It, in fact, 
reduce tax rates, move to balance its budget, come off the backs of a beleaguered economy after uh, a depression that came about because of its previous World War I fostered inflation. But that's not what government did uh, with the coming of the Great Depression in the late 20s and 30s. And so that leads me now to the second phase of the Great Depression, the phase we call the disintegration of the world economy. Now, uh, think back. Uh, this is now, if you recall your history, uh, early 1930. The Republicans are in charge of the White House. The President is Herbert Hoover. Uh, they, ch they are in charge of the Congress. And at that time, uh, Cong the Republican Party was very strongly protectionist. This had gone back to its uh, uh, earliest roots uh, before the Civil War. They were always the high tariff party. So here we are in the spring of 1930. Unemployment is, is, is up there, it, but it's only about 8.5% in the late spring of 1930. This isn't a depression yet. This is just a recession. In the spring of 1930, we had 8% uh, uh, to 9% unemployment, and the stock market had regained half of the ground that it had lost uh, after the bad days of the previous fall. So this is a recession with uh, conditions not even as bad as we have in today's recession. What took it from a recession and made it a depression very quickly? The second phase. Uh, in the face of this high unemployment and facing elections in the fall, the Republicans uh, in the Congress and Herbert Hoover in the White House decided the way to get the economy moving again was to raise tariffs on foreign imports. Their thinking was, if we keep those foreign goods out, then uh, Americans uh, if we keep them out by raising tariffs, uh, raising taxes on those imports, then that will price them so high that Americans will say, gee, foreign goods are too expensive. Uh, instead of buying them, uh, we'll buy American-made goods. And the thinking was, well, that will prompt uh, uh, more hiring at American plants. So raise tariffs, keep foreign goods out, and then you can stimulate employment in American uh, domestic industries. The problem with that idea was, and still is to this day, that you cannot close the door to imports without sooner or later closing the door to exports. Trade is ultimately a two-way street. You, you, um, if you keep foreign goods out, then how can foreigners earn the dollars that they need to buy from us? I mean, after all, they weren't uh, uh, sending boats of goods over, selling them here, and then bringing the boats back empty. Uh, if foreigners couldn't sell their goods here, they couldn't earn the dollars that they needed to buy American agricultural produce. Uh, one third of what American farmers uh, were raising at this time uh, was sold in overseas markets. But with the stroke of the presidential pen and the signing of the Smoot-Hawley tariff in June of 1930, world trade began grinding to a halt. Smoot-Hawley signed by President Hoover, raised tariffs to an all-time high and almost closed the borders. It would have been bad enough on its own, but of course foreign governments uh, took this as a sign of hostility and they did what their people demanded. If Americans are going to keep our goods out, they said, uh, pass tariffs to keep their goods out uh, of our countries. So tariff barriers went up around the world. Governments uh, basically shut trade down with these high tariff barriers, taking a recession and making it very quickly a depression with double-digit unemployment. Now, by year's end, unemployment now is way up in double digits, approaching 20%. Uh, and uh, uh, there is, however, one other thing that happens uh, that I throw into this second phase of the depression. Although it, it isn't related to world trade, it happens before the third phase. So I throw it in here. And it happens in 1932. Uh, you could imagine what must have happened to the federal budget deficit uh, from the onset of the recession of 29, uh, then deepening into the depression of 1930 and beyond. People are being laid off, un uh, unemployment is through the roof, companies aren't making money, so revenues to the federal government are uh, plummeting. But the Hoover administration, hardly this laissez-faire, hands-off, stand-pat, leave-us-alone administration I wish it had been, uh, 
uh, was intervening all over the place. Hoover had his own bailouts. He had his Reconstruction Finance Corporation. He was jawboning business uh, to keep wage rates high, even though prices were falling, which meant that the real cost of labor to business was going through the roof. Uh, he had all kinds of interventions uh, that uh, uh, made matters worse in this period. And with things getting worse, revenues plummeting, spending not being cut, uh, you had this massive federal budget deficit by 1932. Now, that alarmed a lot of Americans. And the Republicans in Congress and in the White House felt, well, by 1932, with the presidential election coming, we'd better do something about these runaway deficits. But of course, there are a couple ways to reduce deficits. Uh, one, and the best way, is to cut spending to meet the shortfall to live as government the same way you and I as individuals must live. If we haven't got the money, we don't spend it, if, if we're responsible. Uh, but they didn't do that. The other way to at least try to raise revenue is to raise taxes. And so in 1932, this other item that I've been alluding to uh, was the Revenue Act of that year, the Revenue Act of 1932, which raised uh, taxes dramatically. It doubled the income tax, uh, the top rate on personal income rose from about 24% to 65% in one fell swoop. That's more than a doubling of the top rate on higher income earners. Uh, it didn't close the deficit gap. It only made the economy worse and set Hoover up even more than Smoot Hawley did for uh, a massive defeat in the, the uh, November 1932 presidential elections. So that's the second phase of the Depression. You have a recession that becomes a depression because of the closing of the borders with Smoot Hawley's uh, Smoot Hawley uh, tariff rates and uh, all kinds of other interventions by Herbert Hoover that wouldn't leave the economy alone, but only made it worse. Then the doubling of the income taxes and and uh, raising other taxes in that bill as well, excise taxes in particular. So that by 1932, you now have uh, something around 25 percent unemployment. That's a presidential election year. And the Republicans will renominate Herbert Hoover, which, uh, who really didn't have a ghost of a chance of winning that election, especially against the charismatic, uh, silver-tongued orator, the governor of New York, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Roosevelt ran as the Democratic nominee. He ran uh, on the Democratic platform. He didn't repudiate a plank of it. Uh, but uh, it's interesting to note what that platform called for. Now, uh, most of you know that the standard history text and your history teacher in high school probably told you that uh, uh, Herbert Hoover was this you know, laissez-faire president who kept his hands off, didn't do anything, while the rest of us suffered. That's hardly the case, as I've just explained. And uh, those history professors and textbooks will also tell you that Franklin Roosevelt had to come in and save the day and, uh, and save capitalism. What they either have forgotten or perhaps never knew, or don't want you to know, is that in 1932, if you were a believer in limited government and free markets and responsible spending at the federal level, you would have voted for Franklin Roosevelt because that's what he promised. He didn't promise what he later delivered. The 1932 Democratic platform called for a 25% reduction in federal spending. Now, this was the biggest proposed reduction in federal spending uh, by any major party in American political history. Roosevelt attacked Herbert Hoover for raising tariffs, raising taxes. He called his administration, quote, the greatest taxing and spending administration in peacetime history. Uh, Roosevelt's uh, running mate, John Nance Garner of Texas, attacked the Hoover administration along similar lines and actually said that Hoover was, quote, leading the country down the path to socialism. OK, this is the Democratic Party ticket of 1932. Uh, the history texts don't tell you this, but that's what Roosevelt ran on. And uh, if I had been around then, and if I had been uh, naive enough to believe that this uh, charlatan was going to deliver on those promises, I would have voted for him and repudiate, repudiated Hoover uh, without hesitation. But it was clear from uh, the day after the election, and especially upon taking office in March of 33, that Roosevelt had no intention 
of carrying out uh, the platform uh, that he had promised, that he had run on. And this now leads me to the third phase of the Great Depression, the phase we call uh, the New Deal. And that, of course, is the name given uh, uh, by Roosevelt to his uh, legislative initiatives, most of which um, uh, happened in the first 100 days, a, a, a blizzard of, of bills uh, that he proposed and that Congress passed. He was a virtual economic dictator uh, in the first part of his term, uh, beginning in March of 33. The country uh, was in desperate shape. The Congress didn't know what to do. Here's a guy who comes in, you know, uh, promising that uh, he has the answers, that, uh, telling the country they have nothing to fear but fear itself. Very charismatic, uh, very good speaker. And so he gets just about everything he asked for. Uh, there are two things about the New Deal that I want to focus on tonight. Of course, it included a lot of things, but the two that were most responsible for uh, keeping us in depression and for a time making it worse uh, were the NIRA, the National Industrial Recovery Act, and the AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Let me take them one at a time. First, the NIRA. Uh, this created a new bureaucracy called the National Recovery Administration. It put a guy in charge uh, who was uh, called Hugh Iron Pants Johnson, General Johnson. He was a red-faced uh, bully who uh, was a professed admirer of Benito Mussolini at the time. Mussolini uh, was not yet the, uh, the really bad guy that people would come to know around the world within a few years after he invaded Ethiopia and later became an ally of Adolf Hitler. In these early years, Mussolini was admired by central planners everywhere because he, he was the take charge type. He was going to fix a beleaguered economy by uh, making the trains run on time and getting people to do what they're supposed to do. He was the strong man who would give the orders to jumpstart an economy. General Johnson, put in charge of the NRA, uh, was of the same view. Well, what did the NRA do, uh, created by the NIRA? The theory of the Roosevelt administration in this first term was that there was too much competition in the economy. They saw prices having gone way down, of course. You know, what would you expect? Uh, foreign markets have just been done away with by smooth hawley You have the Federal Reserve uh, contracting the money supply. Prices are plummeting. And so the Roosevelt people thought, well, look at that. Uh, we need to, uh, if we can get prices to go up, that will cause uh, people to get more income and they'll spend more and that'll cause uh, prosperity in ever widening circles. You got to get prices up. And every time they noticed that somebody cut their prices um, uh, or raised their prices, I should say, somebody else would undercut them. And that was supposedly harmful to the economy. So they passed this law and created this new bureaucracy to force prices up. And they did it through uh, codes and price controls, industry-wide regulations. The effort here was to get businesses to all sing out of the same hymn book, so to speak, uh, to uh, uh, all charge higher prices in unison. There's a famous example I'll cite uh, uh, that really illustrates how ludicrous this was. Uh, uh, it was a, there was a tailor you know, uh, a tailor of uh, mending clothes, that kind of thing. Who, his name was Jack Megan. He was either from New York or New Jersey, as I recall. He was prosecuted under the NRA for charging 35 cents for pressing a suit of clothes instead of the 40 cents mandated by the National Recovery Administration. Now think of it. You're in the midst of a Great Depression. If you're lucky if you've got a suit of clothes to begin with to press. And here's a guy who says, I'll press your clothes for you for 35 cents. He goes to jail because some bureaucrat says, sorry, you should have charged 40 cents. Well, they were doing this nonsense across the economy, forcing prices up, thereby raising the costs of doing business, uh, on average by some 40% throughout the economy. In, in housing and construction, uh, those costs went up by some 55%. Uh, according to my former uh, professor at Grove City College, Hans Senholz. Uh, well, you can't do that without uh, depressing the economy. 
one business's prices are another customer's costs. And so this has a terribly depressing and rippling effect throughout the economy. Uh, but if you think that's bad, what will I tell you about the AAA, the other centerpiece of the uh, New Deal that was especially harmful? The Agricultural Adjustment Act. And as I pointed out when I've given this lecture now hundreds of times, all over the, the world, in fact, uh, they give these crazy pieces of legislation, these attractive sounding names. You know, that's part of the, uh, of the gimmick of the game here. I mean, who couldn't be in favor of adjusting agriculture? It, it was in terrible shape. Plummeting prices, uh, farmers dumping perfectly good milk into ditches because the prices were too low to take it to market. Uh, but they wanted to fix that problem, which they had largely created in Washington because of Smoot-Hawley, Federal Reserve, uh, mismanagement of the money supply, and what have you. They wanted to fix it uh, by forcing prices up again. So the AAA levied a new tax on agriculture. Now think of it. You know, we're in a depression. Farmers have walked off the farm by the tens of thousands. Prices are rock bottom. Uh, costs are too high. Profits have disappeared. So now comes a new tax on uh, particularly millers, refiners, processors, uh, in agriculture, and the money raised from this new tax was used to supervise the destruction of perfectly good fields of, of crops, of, of corn, wheat, and cotton, and the destruction of perfectly healthy cattle, sheep, and pigs. Yep. Can you believe it? Uh, Secretary of Agriculture Henry Wallace, uh, in one single order, uh, ordered the destruction of six million baby pigs. Uh, if you want more detail on this, read such excellent recent books as uh, Bert Folsom's uh, A New Deal or Raw Deal, or Jim Powell's um, FDR's Folly, uh, Amity Schley's The Forgotten Man. Uh, a lot of wonderful scholarship on this in recent years. But So uh, I, I do recall, by the way, there was a farmer who complained I don't recall if it was in testimony to Congress or not, but I thought uh, what he had to say was pretty telling. He complained that before the AAA, he, like other farmers, had trained his mules uh, to uh, walk between the rows as they cultivated the fields. But then under orders from the AAA, they had to train the mules to stomp on the rows, to step on the crops. But uh, the farmer complained that they, he couldn't get the mule to do it. The, 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 his mules were too smart. Now, what does that tell you about the relative intelligence at that time of the nation's mules and the nation's politicians? Uh, but this is what we were doing in the name of economic recovery, destroying things of value. This couldn't possibly improve the economy. Even if it had helped the farmers, it could have done so only at the expense of everybody else. So the economy continues to, uh, to uh, spiral downward in depression. But we get some relief, believe it or not, uh, and uh, things actually improve in 1935-36. We get some relief from rather unexpected quarters. And before I tell you that, I want to check our time. OK, 8.35, we're doing all right. That relief comes from the United States Supreme Court, uh, which will declare in the middle of the decade both the NIRA and the AAA to be unconstitutional, uh, and thereby earn the unending wrath of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He'll begin talking about the, the Supreme Court as those nine old men uh, who had stood in the way of, of the New Deal, of economic recovery, throwing out uh, uh, the best of his New Deal recovery plan. Of course, it was the worst of a non-recovery plan that these uh, uh, nine old men uh, had thrown out. Uh, we'll come back to the Supreme Court in a few moments when we explain what happened in the fourth phase uh, of the Great Depression. Well, um, unemployment uh, with the economy freed of the worst of FDR will actually begin to, uh, to look better in 1936, uh, falling below 20%, but in 1937, the economy takes a, a very steep tumble 
indeed. And with the 1937 relapse, FDR uh, achieves a first, a depression within a depression. We have uh, one of the fastest collapses in American economic history happening in 1937, and that leads me now to the fourth phase of the Great Depression, the phase of the Wagner Act, W-A-G-N-E-R. And by the way, uh, everything I'm telling you tonight, and a lot more, is in my essay, Great Myths of the Great Depression, which you can access at our website, fee.org. It's there in both audio book form uh, and in uh, print form. But uh, here we are now, 1937. Franklin Roosevelt has won re-election in 1936 by a landslide. Uh, he ran against a very colorless uh, Republican, nice guy, probably a decent, honest guy named Alf Landon uh, from uh, Kansas. Uh, but Alf Landon, by election day, was sounding pretty much like a warmed-over Democrat. He was promising that, you know, I'll do what FDR is doing for the most part, but just do it better. So he didn't give the American people much choice. And uh, Roosevelt was giving what sounded like great speeches, fireside chats, you know, giving credit. He, he could mesmerize a lot of Americans into thinking that at least he was doing something. Uh, in fact, Will Rogers, the humor, a great humorist of the day, uh, liked to say that uh, the American people were of a state of mind that if somebody had told them we'd get economic recovery if you just burn the capital down, they'd, they'd be all for it. And you know, uh, uh, well, never mind. But in any event, uh, with government doing all this mischief, but then the Supreme Court giving us some relief, the economy starts to recover, but then we get this big collapse. What brings that on? Well, um, with FDR having won a new term, he comes in, and um, there are several things that explain this 37 uh, collapse. The Wagner Act is the biggest, and I'll reserve that uh, uh, for discussion in a, in a few moments. But first, I have to tell you some other less important uh, factors that did contribute to the 1937 collapse. Uh, one was the Supreme Court packing scheme. Uh, fresh from re-election, Roosevelt decides he's going to go after the Supreme Court that had thrown out the NRA, the AAA, and some other things. But he can't call for the impeachment of those justices. They haven't done anything impeachable. They've called their shot, the shots as they've seen them. They've done their job as they saw it. Uh, so he comes out with a proposal. He says to the Congress, uh, we need some help on the Supreme Court. Uh, it's made up of nine pretty old men. And so why not a provision in the law that says that for every justice who reaches the age of 70 and who does not voluntarily retire, the president should get to appoint one new one. If that had passed in 1937, it would have meant that within the next couple of years, uh, he could have appointed five new justices to the Supreme Court, and thereby packing it with people who uh, thought as he did. This was not good for the investment climate. Uh, anybody who, had, who still had a few pennies to, to invest had to think, gee, I, I'm going to wait and see how this thing turns out, because if he gets that, he's going to be in charge effectively of all branches of government. All that uh, New Deal garbage is going to come back. I'm not going to invest in this kind of climate. So that, that contributed to uh, uh, the 37 collapse. But fortunately, it was the first big battle that FDR lost. Uh, his own party deserted him on it, and after several months of debate, uh, the Congress rejected that plan uh, to pack the court. Uh, but we also had, in 1937, the undistributed profits tax. Uh, as you may know, corporations, when they earn money, uh, earn profit, uh, they can distribute it to their shareholders. They can keep some of it as retained earnings, or they can do some combination of the two. Uh, retained earnings, or undistributed profits, are a very important source of capital and of growth and expansion. But Roosevelt, in 1936 and 37, uh, was coming uh, under the influence of people like John Maynard Keynes, who argued that uh, the problem in the economy was not enough spending. And greedy corporations are contributing to the problem because too many of them are keeping their profits in the form of retained earnings instead of distributing them to their shareholders. 
So we got to discourage that and get them to distribute it so the money gets out there and gets spent. That was the thinking in Washington. So Roosevelt proposed an undistributed profits tax of nearly uh, uh, something like 80 or 85 percent. In other words, he's saying to American business, any profits that you earn, that you've taken the risk uh, to earn, and that I've had nothing to do with, uh, that you don't distribute to, their share, to your shareholders, I want 85 percent of it, not uh, a factor that would cause confidence uh, for investors in the economy. And it's at a time, by the way, when Roosevelt is busy looking and actively raising taxes everywhere he can. Before he's done, uh, the top income tax rate will actually be in the 90s. It'll be 91, 92 percent under Roosevelt. This is a guy who attacked Hoover when Hoover raised them uh, to 65 percent. In fact, at one point, Roosevelt, uh, a little later on, will actually propose a 100 percent income tax rate on all incomes over $25,000. He, uh, uh, this was after he couldn't get a 99 percent rate through Congress, and then in retaliation and in anger, he imposed by executive order this 100 percent rate on income over $25,000. Uh, fortunately, Congress uh, got rid of that. Uh, and if it had ever been challenged in court, uh, it, it might well have been thrown out. But this is the climate that Roosevelt is, is creating here, this anti-business. He's always attacking people of enterprise, even though he himself has never, was never a man of enterprise. He was getting a monthly allowance from his mother uh, clear up until she passed away in, I think, 1941. Uh, this guy was born with a silver spoon in his mouth and never ran a lemonade stand, let alone an, an economy. Um, uh, and he also had more Federal Reserve mischief, another uh, expansion and contraction of the money supply in the mid-30s, that uh, erratic mismanagement once again. Uh, but the biggest factor that explains the great collapse of 37 was the Wagner Act, uh, formerly known as the National Labor Relations Act, sometimes uh, called uh, Labor's Magna Carta. It uh, bestowed enormous new powers upon uh, American organized labor, made it easier to organize. This was the origin of uh, collective bargaining, of uh, exclusive rights of representation, of compulsory unionism in America. Uh, within a year or so, the number of people in labor unions will rise by a factor of at least three, as I recall. The number of man hours in 1937 lost to strikes uh, uh, more than doubled from what it was the year before, from about 14 million man hours lost in 36 to almost 30 million lost in 1937. This is the time of the sit-down strikes in the auto factories of Michigan. Uh, lots of militancy uh, in workplaces, strikes, shutdowns, uh, and violence, and as a result, soaring labor costs and a very sour climate uh, for investors. Some of these powers bestowed upon labor by the uh, national uh, Labor Relations Act will be whittled, whittled back by Congress in later years. But in 37, this was devastating uh, to the economy. It really was, and a major factor for collapse. And we're still living, of course, uh, under the baneful uh, or baleful influences of um, the National Labor Relations Act, which took disputes, uh, labor disputes, out of the ordinary courts and put them before a regulatory body called the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, in any event, the American economy, under the weight of this stuff uh, from Washington, will uh, bump along in depression for a few more years. Some people say, ah, the war is what ended the depression. And it's clear that unemployment after Pearl Harbor, which was December of 1941, did decline. But, you know, uh, that's what you have to expect when you send 11 million uh, young Americans to, to Europe. But when you look at such things as uh, measures of consumer welfare, during the war years, they didn't get better. Unemployment officially may have gone down, but uh, the general standards of living, consumer welfare, did not improve. If anything, uh, they got worse. Instead of making uh, refrigerators and cars, we were making tanks and guns and planes, arguably necessary if you're going to fight a war, but don't confuse that with economic stimulus and recovery. That's redistribution and destruction, not growth and recovery. Uh, 
we didn't get sustained uh, economic recovery and consumer welfare until after the war, 1945 and 46. So in a very real sense, it's not an exaggeration to say that the American economy didn't really recover until Franklin Roosevelt didn't. Uh, he died in April 1945. Harry Truman assumes office. He got rid of some of the more radical New Dealers. He wasn't as anti-business as FDR was. He even signed into law in 1945 a dramatic reduction in the corporate income tax rate, uh, which went down from something like, uh, 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 what was it? Uh, oh, I, I'm drawing a blank, but it was up in the 70s, I think. Uh, it, it was cut to, no, it was about 90%, the topic corporate income tax rate. He cut it down to 35% or 38% in 1945. Uh, and uh, you also had and this may surprise uh, any Keynesians who are listening, uh, we had in 1945 and 6 the greatest reduction in federal government spending in American economic history. Now, isn't that under the Keynesian formula supposed to lead to economic collapse? Uh, just the opposite of the big spending stimulus we have today. We had a big spending reduction, largely because of the demobilization uh, uh, of the war. Uh, but we didn't get collapse we got essentially an economic recovery, a boom. Uh, and so I need to wrap this up by just saying this to you, and then we'll take questions. Anybody who can look at this litany of, of failure, of massive intervention, monetary and credit manipulation, closing of borders through sky-high tariffs, raising taxes to stratospheric levels, crushing competition by destroying crops and forcing prices up and throwing business people in jail uh, uh, for mutually beneficial voluntary transactions. Uh, all of this unbelievably crazy mischief coming out of Washington, anybody who can look at that and still say that the Great Depression was caused by laissez-faire, by capitalism, by free markets, uh, is either woefully, woefully ill-informed or has some statist agenda that they're putting ahead of basic facts, logic, reason, uh, and evidence. So with that, I'm happy now to uh, open it up to questions. And uh, I'm ready uh, at the direction of our hosts at SFL. Great. Fantastic, Larry. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, we actually um, we have a lot of questions here. So to get started, a question um, from Ryan Drake. He, he wonders, um, and he's been told by many college professors of his that the that the Great Depression was caused because we were on a gold standard prior to prior to the Depression. Um, any comments on that? Oh yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, I didn't mention anything about gold. Uh, I should have perhaps, but uh, I probably went as long as I should without it. Roosevelt did seize American gold holdings in 1933. You had. Uh, Within a month, to turn in, uh, you had to turn in all of your gold coin uh, to the U.S. government. Fortunately, they didn't take the gold that might have been in your teeth, uh, but they took all our coin under penalty of $10,000 in fines or 10 years in prison. Roosevelt, uh, like other politicians throughout history, didn't like gold because he couldn't print it. Uh, by 1933, when he did that, we were already uh, dramatically uh, removed from a, a solid gold standard. Uh, and so to blame the Great Depression on, on the gold standard is to ignore the fact that since 1913 we had a central bank, the Federal Reserve. Uh, it could by law uh, allow for the expansion of money and credit to the point where the gold behind it would only represent 40% of the, of the paper outstanding. Uh, we had this uh, monetary manipulation by the Federal Reserve uh, so we didn't have a gold standard, uh, not by my definition, nothing like what we'd had uh, during periods, um, brief periods in the 19th century. And we've never really had a gold standard in, Amer in America that was completely unadulterated. We always had government you know, all over the place. But when we had something approaching uh, a gold standard, even with the government mischief that came along with it, we had sound currency, uh, we had dollars that you could put aside knowing that uh, they, they keep their value over long periods. We had depressions, but in each case it was because of other government interventions, not, not the gold standard. Great. Thanks, Larry. Um, we got a couple of different questions on um, 
um, on some similar themes here, so I'm going to combine them as best I can. A couple of questions um, on the, uh, the court packing um, and um, on the Wagner Act. Um, uh, I suppose um, the general gist is, would things have played out differently? How would America be different if um, you know, that had not been passed? Um, and then, um, kind of just a follow-up to that, um, one person's curious if the Wagner Act applied um, to, public sec uh, to public sector employees as well. Okay, the first question uh, was how, how different might things have been had the, the court backing scheme passed? Uh, yes. Okay, because it, it did not pass. Yes, it did not well, pass. Well, uh, yeah, we, would uh, we wouldn't have nine justices. Uh, we'd have whatever number corresponded with you know, how many would stay on after the age of 70 and then uh, the, the, the president appointing uh, new ones to take their place. So theoretically, I suppose you could have as many as 18. Uh, on the court if that had passed. Um, in 1937, if that had passed at that time, there's no question that within a couple of years, maybe much sooner, uh, there would have been a substantial majority on the court that would have rubber stamped uh, even the worst of FDR's New Deal stuff. And that would have come back, uh, that New Deal stuff, with a vengeance. And because Roosevelt didn't really recant any of that, uh, and uh, I would guess it would have made the Great Depression worse and probably uh, last even longer uh, than it did. Uh, I, I don't see any good coming out of uh, that court packing scheme had it passed. The second question was, uh, uh, oh, Wagner Act, did it apply to uh, the public sector? No, it didn't. In fact, Franklin Roosevelt himself, to his credit, uh, didn't feel as though there should be uh, uh, exclusive representation by organized labor and compulsory unionism in the public sector. Uh, that'll come later uh, uh, in state by state, uh, mostly in the 1960s when states passed sort of their own Wagner Acts, you might say, for their public sector employees. Great, thanks. Um, uh, a follow-up to that. Uh, um, it's often said that uh, the justices change their minds on the court opinions um, out of fear that they were going to be replaced or that you know their voice was going to be mitigated um, by these new potential additions. So was Roosevelt successful in scaring the justices and, um, into changing their views and allowing him to pass what he wanted? Uh, to, some, to some extent he was and I don't know that it was because of fear that they'd be replaced especially after the packing scheme went down it was more out of, um, uh, you know, this guy just won a re-election. It seems to be what the people want. Uh, and, uh, and maybe it just kind of wore some of them down. But he mostly got, uh, uh, you know, over time we get a more uh, statist court because the old timers uh, simply died off. And then he and subsequent uh, uh, presidents like uh, Truman and uh, uh, Eisenhower gave us justices who rubber stamped a lot of this big government stuff. Great, thanks. So uh, a question here from Nicola. Um, so if all of this is true about Roosevelt, then why is he seen um, historically as one of the best presidents of all time? Um, is, you know, is that just a matter of, um, of his own propaganda or is it something else? Well, historians uh, by and large, going back decades, have, have had a very statist bias. Uh, and uh, what I mean by that is most historians buy into this notion that, uh, they're, you know, that, that it's good to have this enlightened elite uh, at the top sort of telling the rest of us what to do because otherwise it'd be chaos and the enlightened elite can uh, guide us uh, on the road to national unity and prosperity. Uh, so they, they tend to favor big government. They like activist government. They like politicians who push the frontiers of government. I mean, there's a lot more to write about if you're a, an historian. If you're writing about a guy who was always proposing legislation, creating new bureaucracies, pushing people around, that's a lot more colorful, makes for bigger books than a president who uh, leaves us alone and goes fishing and uh, gets off her back. Um, but there were plenty of historians, too, who were of another opinion. But the dominant orthodoxy until recently has been much uh, uh, favorable to FDR because those doing that writing 
the, the dominant historiography has been very, uh, very statist in persuasion. Great, thanks. So we have a couple of different questions, all kind of on the same uh, theme of, um, are we headed for another depression? Um, and I, I know the mass economic collapse. If so, what are the causes of that, and what can we do about it? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, keep in mind that uh, as an Austrian, I would uh, never uh, predict uh, the precise course of an economy. Uh, that's for the uh, <laughs> false pretenses of a central planner to do, uh, and who almost always gets it wrong, too. Uh, but we do know that uh, nothing has happened in Washington to get us off this merry-go-round. We haven't abolished the Federal Reserve. Uh, we are still relying upon, uh, you know, quote, stimuli from uh, Washington in the form of uh, uh, lots of spending and creation of money and credit to make the economy go. But we also know that uh, that stuff only seems to work sometimes in the very short run. It always carries with it the seeds of eventual disaster. Uh, and we can only put that disaster off when we go back uh, to uh, uh, to those bad policies. Uh, so I can say this much to you, that uh, uh, to think that anything that's happened in Washington precludes a Great Depression would be nonsense. We could have another one again. All we'd have to do is to inflate and uh, manufacture more money and credit, which we've been doing, you know, hand over fist. And then we could engineer either massive tax hikes or tariff hikes or uh, a reversal of monetary policy, and the house of cards would come tumbling down. Uh, never underestimate the ability of politicians to screw up your life and the economy. Uh, and uh, they're busy at it all the time, not always because they intend uh, that to happen, but because it's folly to begin with to think that they can plan an economy of 305 million people. They will sooner or later ultimately uh, uh, screw it up for all of us. So uh, probably a big depression is in our future. When? I don't know. What precisely might trigger it? I don't know. But everything is in place uh, still uh, to make that happen. And the only way you can stop it from happening at some point is a radical monetary reform that, that uh, ends the Federal Reserve System, gets the government out of this business that has failed miserably at for uh, nearly 100 years and uh, also balance the federal budget slash spending and rely upon markets and choice, uh, uh, personal choice, not politicians' whims uh, to guide the economy. All right, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry, everybody, but we are out of time, even though we've got another dozen or so questions lined up. Uh, thank you so much, Larry, and to all of our participants this evening. I hope you all can thank continue you. coming back uh, to our thank webinars. Everybody does. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks to all those who Tune in tonight, and I hope you'll visit our website at fee.org, and thank you for your support of SFL. Absolutely. Thank you, Larry. Um, if anyone is interested in getting a hard copy of Great Misses of the Great Depression, contact Students for Liberty or Fee, and we can definitely provide those. We have a box of about 200 sitting in our office right now. Um, next week, our webinar is going to feature Dr. Jim Lark again, and he's going to discuss how government man governmentally mandated safety measures may be hazardous to your health. Now, on a final note, shortly after this, you'll be emailed a follow-up survey to the webinar. Please take a quick minute to fill it out. It'll let us continue to improve these webinars that have been a great success over the last nine months to a year. Um, thank you again, and we're officially wrapped up. I hope you all have a wonderful night. In the webinar.